Good afternoon, this is Schweitzer. I'm going to highlight today a specific type of reaction called a redox reaction. Just so you know that in chemistry at our level, there are three different types of reactions that we may or may not see. One's called an oxidation reduction reaction, which we're going to learn today. A solubility reaction, which we've already learned about in this chapter. Another one is, is coming up in a future chapter called an acid-base reaction. Uh, just a quick highlight on this guy, an oxidation reduction reaction to transfer of an electron. This one literally is just something that goes to insoluble, so a cation and an anion that attract to one another, forming a solid. An acid-base an acid reaction is actually the transfer of an H plus ion as opposed to electron. All right, um, let's jump into this. So what is a radiox reaction and how, how would you describe a radox reaction? Well, first of all, because it is a, it is a transfer of electrons. Now, electrons have charge. So another way we might describe this is the transfer of charge. So sometimes you might see that over the course of a reaction, a particular charges are changing. So we want to look, possibly look for these changes, charges changing. So this reaction becomes actually Ag0 plus Cu plus 2. We balance it. More on that later. Looks like that. Okay, there's a little, uh, some naming thing here on this guy. So, we call oxidation and reduction. These are two terms that are relatively old. Um, in, in our sort of sphere, there's oxidation. Okay, which typically used to mean to give something oxygen oxygen. And then we have uh, reduction, okay, which meant to lose oxygen. And these two definitions are still valid. They do work, which is why they're still here, but we've completely changed the base definition of oxidation. And because the names no longer because the names no longer match the, our given definition, which I'm going to do in a second here, they have a little acronym. Okay? And then uh, uh, there are a couple of them. This is one that's common around here. It is Leo, the lion, says Gur. Right? And so what is oxidation? It's lose electrons oxidize. Now again, this, this is kind of weird. But that's legitimately how bad the name is for this thing. It's ridiculous, to be honest with you. So this is gain electrons reduce or reduction. So reduction actually means to gain electrons. I and mean, this doesn't get any more ridiculous than this, which is why we have to use this little acronym thing to help keep us straight. And I have used this thing in my brain more times than you can possibly imagine because the name doesn't mean anything anymore. So, in this case, who's being oxidized, who's being reduced? Now, sometimes you can see us easily, sometimes not so much. But uh, a silver atom, for example, um, look on the, on the periodic table and see how many, how many particular protons a silver atom has. Pause for a second. Go take a look. All right. So you'll notice, for example, a pro this guy has 47 protons. And because it's a plus one, means it has one more proton electron, so it has 46 electrons. Now over here, the silver atom still has 147 protons. But now it has 47 electrons. So in this case, the silver atom, silver atom, we're having 47, uh, so let's go, let's go with electrons because we're talking about those. So 46 
electrons. Put it all over. 46 electrons. It's plus one. To having the silver atom that will charge 47 electrons. And we want to track everything that's going on here. So what has to happen to this silver? It's the same atom, by the way. Okay? Same exact atom. What has to happen to this atom for it to get from 46 to 47? It needs to gain an electron. And if you want to take a look over here, gain electrons, this thing is being reduced. So any time you have electrons on the reactant side, this is a reduction. Some people might use that acronym even better than the Leo Ger reactant. Any time we're on the reactant side, electrons, it's considered a reduction. And, of course, the silver obviously is gaining negative charge to get to zero. Who is being reduced? The silver atom is being reduced. And if the silver atom is gaining electrons, there's only one atom that can give it to them. And that's the copper. So this guy is being oxidized. You could easily go and look and see, okay, same thing we did. How many does the copper have now? How many does it have afterwards? Okay. Copper itself typically has 20, 29 uh, protons. So this guy's got 29 electrons. And this guy only has 27. Uh, so again, it lost electrons over the course of this, of this exchange. Okay. All right. Long here. Okay. So modeling redox reactions. Again, just like with solubility, we have a beaker we can model it with, and we have a different like formulas we can we have spectators too. Now, something you want to be aware of is if it doesn't have a charge like this one, zero, it's going to be in its elemental state. For zinc element, it's just a solid. Pretty solids are very common, um, but um, it could be a liquid or it could be a gas, but solids are pretty common. This is an ionic compound. It's going to be in water, obvious. This is plus two, this is minus one. Okay. That's why the two is there. So let's model this. So I'm going to have a solid zinc. So in this before beaker, I have to have a solid chunk of zinc. Okay. And we'll go with this color. This the guy in right here has this color right here. Okay. All right. Now, in solution here, I have, okay, some of my copper 2 plus ions. So Cu plus 2. And two nitrates. I'm going to use just a dash because the nitrate is going to be our spectator. So the metals will exchange metals. Okay. So we're exchanging electrons. So a couple of things you might want to note here is that metals will exchange with other metals, and non-metals will exchange. With other non-metals. This is a metal, so it'll exchange with this metal here. And we're gonna end up getting zinc two plus plus this one here. Okay. And they're gonna exchange. Now when they exchange charge, in this case, the copper becomes no charged, and the zinc becomes two plus, and the nitrate is just a long for the ride. And I don't even need these princes here because it's also minus one, so there's two there. I do need. So what would this look like afterwards? Okay, well, let's see. We got our big stick of zinc. Okay. Uh, we got our water. There's blue. Much better picture this time. And of course, this is still this is my zinc stick. I'm not going to use all of it because there's a lot there. But what happens afterwards? Okay, now in this situation, okay, the copper went up here to the zinc and they exchanged. And it just looks like now we have solid copper and zinc 2 plus ions in solution. So I'll draw my zinc 2 plus in solution. And copper's got kind of a goldish color, so I'm going to put right here. Now, this thing, this copper atom, as soon as it loses its electron, its charge, it has no longer has the ability to dissolve. So, no charge, no charge, 
equals no resolve. It literally like loses it instantly. You might think to yourself, okay, well, I, I don't give it any chance. No, as soon as it exchanges here, it loses it and at least sticks here. Could it fall off to the bottom? Yeah, it could. All right. We call this electrical plating, and there are ways of getting it to stay on there, which we could learn about in a different class. But this is just a coat, solid copper here. All right, so that's how we're modeling it in the beaker. It's just an exchange of electrons between two metals. All right, uh, in this case, molecular. I have it right here. Okay, this is the molecular equation. We don't always put a solid here, but you should realize that uh, if there's no charge, it's going to go back to its solid state. And this, of course, would be dissolved potentially as well. All right, ionic. I'm just going to mimic what we have here. It's going to be zinc plus copper plus 2 plus NO3 minus 1 yields copper metal plus zinc 2 plus plus NO3 minus. That ionic, remove spectator, is NO3 minus, and it's just zinc metal plus copper plus 2 yields copper metal plus zinc 2 plus. There's a little bit more going on behind the scenes here, but that's basically the exchange process. We're going to learn a little more about how the exchange takes place, how to quantify the exchange, and then, for, and then how to balance it. And that's coming up here. But eventually, we're going to use this model to just basically, you know, to, to mimic what we're doing. The model simply is, let's say, X plus Y, Z yields metal exchange of metal. So then Y plus X, Z. Now you'll notice that even though the molecular version keeps these things together, they're actually separate. And Z is just kind of floating around on its own. That's a typical model that we might follow. Let's use that model right now. Okay, so again, that's X, and I'm not listing whether it's a, it's a metal or non-metal in my model. This is a metal, and it's going to exchange. And that's going to produce elemental Y plus a charged X, and the Z never changed. Notice my charges are changing. That's a good indication we have a radox reaction. Okay, so let's make a silver by itself. And you don't have to put that zero there, but just emphasize the fact that there's no charge. Plus A L. This is a plus three. Now why is it plus three? Look in your ion sheet, and you'll find that in nature aluminum only has one option. It can't go anywhere else. So it is what it is. And the NL3 is just going to be like this. This, of course, is my molecular. This would balance out quite easily. Three nitrates, three nitrates, three silvers, three silvers. You'll find that balancing um, will, will be nice later on. Okay, now let's, let's do this. Let's draw this out. So again, I have my solid piece of silver. I'll draw that. Now I could just drop it at the bottom if I wanted to. Okay, All right, let's do that. Let's just drop it in. And it just sits on the bottom. Okay, this is my aluminum. Okay. In solution. Uh, I have, let's do some blue. I have in here silver nitrate. Okay, so it's a little bit smaller letter. I have AG plus, and I'm going to draw three of them because it says I need three, so I'm just going to draw three as well. Doesn't make a difference. And I have a bunch of nitrates. I'll draw those in here as well. They go down, they migrate down, and they exchange. Looks like three of these and one of those. Gives me three of these and one of those. Okay, let's do that. So now, my, for the most part, my big aluminum stick probably is still pretty well there. Aluminum. And then I have uh, three silvers. I'm going to draw those a slightly different color. Now, all three of those drop down. One, two, three. Because it says there's three of these to one of these. Three of these to one of these. I'm using that ratio. We'll see more about how it gets there later. So three of these, one of those. All right. And 
in this case, a L plus 3, and I have 1, 2, 3. Now you might notice here as well as I put my little water line in here, what do you notice about the charge here? I have three positives that went down, and one positive 3 came up. That's, that's what's going on here, okay? So let's go ahead and let's draw out the, the template in formula-wise. Got the molecular ready. So ionic, pretty simple, just draw it as it is. A, G plus, plus A, L, plus N, O, 3, minus, yields. Now in this case, this is no charge. Just, you know, I got a little bit of order, but it doesn't make a difference. Here I got the aluminum, I got aluminum plus 3. It's that guy. Three solid silvers. And I have a nitrate. I'm just separating these guys out there. They're, they're aren't together. Okay. Spectator is just going to be the nitrate. And it's going to be A, G plus, A, L, no charge, yields A, L plus 3 plus A, G. Now, now again, I, I balanced this earlier, and you might be able to see how it's working out balance-wise. But if you don't see it yet, we'll do more about that, which will make it a little bit easier to see in that three hawk spot here that last one right there okay all right again following the template so what are some things you want to keep in mind about our oxidation reaction models okay in our model keep in mind we typically again we'll do this in lab and it'll become even more obvious we're gonna have a chunk of metal typically some solid plus an ionic solution so we have to have, we're dropping something solid into a solution that contains cations and anions floating around. Okay. And this is our model. So no charge, no charge. So if you have no charge, this means that you are not dissolved. This trying to emphasize the fact that on paper, you can write things down and have no idea what it means physically. In a beaker or in a in a battery, for example, this stuff's going to run batteries. It's the, it's the chemistry of batteries. So this is not the only way to represent a redox reaction, but it's very common. So there's lots of different types. This is just one one of them. So this is our model. Keep that in mind. Now here I have a metal exchange with a metal. Here a non-metal exchange with a non-metal. That's why we change it around. We'll see an example of that coming up here. All right, so how do I predict the products? Now, again, I'm going to get into this a little bit, but essentially for us, we're going to be following our little model. But I want to just talk about a little bit more about how this works, okay? Because in nature, not everything can just change charges willy-nilly to whatever it wants. In nature, atoms and ions only have so many options. And if that option is not available, nothing happens. So copper, for example, can be no charge. Copper can be plus one, and copper can be plus two. Okay. Silver can be no charge, and silver can be plus one. So if I mix these two together, what option do I have? Well, the silver, all the silver can do is go from plus one to nothing. All it can do is gain an electron. Well, if silver is going to gain an electron, then this guy is going to go to positive. So we could get positive plus one, and then silver, no charge. I could go copper plus two, but then I need two silver atoms, each of them to take one of them, because the silver, silver only takes one. So now if I have silver metal, again, this guy can only... Um, in this case, it wants to go from silver plus, so it's going to lose an electron. Okay, well, give an electron, because all it can do is go plus. So A, G, plus. And this guy picks up an electron. That's fine. Okay, copper, either plus one. And if it wants to go copper, metal, no charge, well, that just means we need two of these silver pluses, each of them giving away one electron to satisfy the two electron drain. All right, what about this guy? Okay, well, the only thing that silver can do is take an electron to go to silver metal. So I'm not going to refer to like a silver like this. 
is the silver has its back against the wall. It can only go one way. This guy has his back against the wall. It can go one way. This guy here, back in, well, this guy can go either way. It can go there, or it can go there. So what this guy is, is back against the wall. All this thing can do in nature, okay, is gain electrons too. These guys can only gain. This guy can gain, this can gain. Only way for this guy to, get, to gain electrons is if this guy goes more positive. It's not exist in nature. So this would be a no reaction. There's just nothing going to happen here. Wouldn't be possible. So we want to make sure metals exchange with metals. That way we have something with no charge, and it has a charge, and it can produce something that then takes up a charge and something that doesn't have a charge. That's why metals exchange metals. So a metal with no charge exchanges with a metal that has a charge, and that works out nicely. Here again, both have no charges. Okay, so in this case, this guy here wants to lose electron to this guy to make this guy copper, let's say, plus 2. That's going to give me silver minus 2. That's not going to happen. It's just in nature, it just doesn't work. Okay. All right, so then if you have copper plus 1 ion, you can actually react that with another copper plus 1 ion. And you could have a reaction where one went to Cu metal and the other one went to Cu plus 2. So technically that would work. All right, so just a couple examples how that might run. All right, so why is electron actually exchanging in a reaction reaction? Well, first of all, okay, trying to go to a lower energy state, high energy atoms release energy and go to a lower, more stable energy state. Example, why is a ball right on the hill? Well, the ball is at the top of the hill. It already contains the energy. And it rolls down the hill. And it gives off in the term of heat and other things, friction, and becomes on the bottom. If you want to, so it's releasing energy in that form. If you take that ball and you want to put it back to the top of the hill, you would need to invest energy into this. And of course, this energy is not, if it's not provided, the ball will not go to the top. So we call a reaction that has the energy and therefore can go all but from really from the left to the right. We can go from, from reactants to products all by itself without having to invest energy. We call this thermodynamically favorable. The reaction can run from reactants to products from left to right on the paper. Um, there you go. If there's an overall loss of energy, overall more stable, process is thought to be very favorable. This means that it will happen by itself and will not feed it any energy to make the process go. Very kind of important thing. I'll use this term quite often. Alright, so here's some everyday things. And the question is, are these processes thermodynamically favorable? We'll say smile would be yes. And frowny means no, you're going to have to invest in energy. Ball rolling up a hill. Okay, mention that no. Charging your cell phone, and the answer is no. You, your charge phone, your phone will not charge on its own unless you plug it in. Okay, making a, a phone in your a cell phone in your making a call on your cell phone. This one is if they're favorable, meaning that the phone already has the energy it just needs to go through the process. Cooking a hot dog. So I cook a hot dog because you need to add energy to this process. No energy doesn't get cooked. Non-favorable. Ice melting room temperature. Do you have to do anything? So again, anything that you don't have to do anything, it just goes on its own. This is thermodynamically favorable. You can't fire a log burn. Now you have to add some energy of activation. Activation, but once you get that done, it runs on its own. So this one is a thermodynamically favorable. Can a process that is non variable actually run? So can a process that is non thermodynamically favorable actually run? The answer is no. Okay, if you have a ball at the bottom of the hill, can you get it to the top of the hill? And the answer is yes. Any non 
thermodynamically favorable reaction can run, you just need to invest energy, and then it will run. Can you charge yourself? Yes, if you add energy. So non-thermodynamically favorable reactions can run, they just need to be fed. All right, so how do we know if a reaction is thermodynamically favorable? No, if a, therm if a reaction, a rash reaction is thermodynamically favorable, it will then run all by itself not have to do anything. So look, let's look at a redox reaction a little closer. The reaction is an exchange and therefore there is a loser and there is a taker or a giver and a loser. So how does this work? Well, okay, so if we have person, let's say person A and we have person B, okay, and let's just make a human example of this. And let's say person A takes person B's lunch well, there's a chance that person A wants this to happen. I might use a smiley face, okay, and there's a chance that person A wants to take the lunch, and the person A also wants to get rid of the lunch. In that case, this thing is going to happen. Maybe it's something that person B doesn't like, okay? There's a chance that person A uh, doesn't want the lunch, there's a chance that person B doesn't want to give it to them, and therefore there would be no exchange, and this would be a no reaction. If there's a person chance where person A wants the lunch, and person B doesn't want to give them the lunch, well then it's going to be a battle. Whoever wins out, wins out. It could be either this, or it could be that, depending on who is bigger. Who's got more energy? Okay, and there's a chance that maybe A doesn't want to take the lunch, but person B says, no, take it. You have to take this thing. I don't want it. So once again, there's a possibility that this guy forces it to happen. We could either have no, or we could have yes. Possibility to make how big that guy is to make him take it. So in this case, we have an exchange. Okay, copper and metal exchanging. Okay, we're going to walk through kind of how this works with voltage. Now, what is voltage? This is sort of, and it's got a lot of different definitions, but sort of a description of what I just talked about here. A po positive voltage, okay, now voltage could be symbolized V, could be symbolized as an E, like that, curly Q, E, all right? All right, you might see a curly Q, E. So it's got other ways, even EMF is another name, electromotive force. So essentially a positive voltage means, yes, this wants to occur. Apply that to this situation. A negative voltage means, okay, no, this doesn't, this is not thermodynamically favorable, meaning that can it, have, it has to be driven. All right, so let's, Let's sort of detail this exchange. I have copper, which is no charge. I have zinc, which is two plus, and it's gonna form potentially copper two plus plus zinc metal, okay? Now in this case, let's write our half reactions. Half reactions look like this, just this guy's experience and this guy's experience. So it's gonna be copper metal goes to copper plus two. That's what happens to this guy. And then the zinc 2 plus goes to zinc metal. Now, we kind of talked about this before. We put electrons on one side versus the other. We did that a couple slides back. It's not hard to see that two electrons are involved here. The question is, which side do they go on? I mentioned if they're on the left-hand side, it's reduction. Right-hand side, it's going to be oxidation. I just want to make sure that, that the electrons are balanced. Just pick a size. Okay, well, if I put them here as a reduction, a negative 2 and a no charge doesn't equal a positive 2. So I want to take those off of there and just put them over here. Does it balance it? Positive, negative 2 equals 0. If one, so this guy's losing these two electrons, this guy, same atom, losing electrons, it's going to give them to this guy. This guy will be gaining electrons. Positive 2 plus 2 electrons equals this guy, all right? 
Now, every half reaction, this one is reduction, and this one is oxidation. Okay? And oxidation electrons in the product side, reduction on the reactant side. So, now we need to get a voltage for these processes. In your workbook, you'll find a list of what's called reduction potentials. I'll pull line this up right now and give you an example. Alright, so let's find these guys out now. This is what's called a reduction potential chart. So notice that all of them have electrons on the reactant side. Everything here is reduction. Alright, so let's go back and see what we have here. So we have this is a reduction. You're gonna find this reaction right on the chart as is. So let's go find it. Find the sink. There it is. Electrons on the other side. It doesn't matter. There, got a little bridge inside. And this is my hold. I mean that this thing doesn't really want to happen. Okay. Therefore, it's going to happen. I have it on there ready. Okay. Um, there we go. This is going to be a negative 0.76 volts. Copper. Okay. Now, this is oxidation. So I go to my chart. See that I have my copper on here. It's right here. Copper plus two electrons. That's backwards. So this is going to be negative 0.34 volts. I'm going to flip it. So if I, I, I'm always going to flip one of them. The oxidation is going to get flipped. There's always a reduction. There's always an oxidation. So this one is going to be a negative 0.34 volts. Negative 0.34 volts. And how do we get our overall voltage? You add them together. It's a negative 1.1 volts. All right, that means that voltage system are really matching this system right here. Neither of them want to do it, so this is not going to occur. So I take a beaker that's full of zinc nitrate. I drop it in a stick of copper. All right, nothing happens. Can I get this reaction to run? Yes. I have to literally use energy to get it to run. It will not run on its own. Alright, so positive voltage runs on its own, negative it doesn't. Alright, let's run through a couple of more examples. Let's see a few more charts here. Alright, let's go here. Alright, first things first, let's predict our products and see what we're going to get here. Okay, now here we're going to get sodium. So the sodium aluminum is now on its own. And then they were going to have the NA plus 1 change. It's a redox reaction. And then we have C2H3O2 minus 1 charge balance. There we go. Half reaction, the aluminum is going to aluminum plus 3. That's this guy. Minus 1 goes to aluminum metal plus. Three electrons, and then the sodium goes to Na plus plus one electron. And now, a couple things we're going to do here: get our voltages here. Okay. Now, this guy is getting rid of electrons. This guy's picking them up. So this guy is going to happen three times. Three, three. And that way it gives away the electrons, which are then picked up on this side. So my overall balanced equation is going to be uh, aluminum plus 3 plus 3 sodium metals yields 3 sodium pluses plus 1 aluminum. Hopefully you realize that the electrons are equal there. Okay, let's get our voltages. So we need a, this is a reduction. So this one be as is on the chart. If you look at it. I'm going to go to this one. The aluminum. And we find aluminum and it's right here. And it's going to be a negative 1.66. This is not looking good. Alright, so we got here. Negative 1.66. Let's find the sodium. Now the sodium, there's three of them. Do not multiply times three. It's just an inherent charge for, for this. Sodium is going to be, and now this one's going to have to get flipped. So I'll put there it is. And it's a negative 2.7. But if we're going to flip it to a positive 
2.71. So this is going to be a net positive. And there we go. Positive 2.71. Add those two together for our overall voltage. And get 1.05. Because it's positive, this thing is going. And this is my balanced equation. This is our first example where we're going to do the non-metal, non-metal exchange, non-metals. Line the two there because it's tectonic. It's one of seven tectonic atoms. All right, let's predict our products using our model. So the iodine, one of the odds on is, is also tectonic. And then the NaF will be the other plus one minus one. Let's do our half reactions. It's going to be I negative goes to I two. I have two iodines. I need to have a two here. And where are my electrons? Two negative, no charge. I'm going to put two electrons right here. That will balance me. And then I have F two goes to F negative. I need two of them. And I'm going to put two electrons on this side. This is a reduction. This is oxidation. Let's go to our chart. Let's find our voltages. Okay. All right. So we have, in this case, we have fluorine on this top one here, top dot, and it's reduction 2.87. Okay. You know, it's the same exact reaction we have written down with the twos. Okay. 2.87. Iodine is going to be located right here. Okay, now this one's backwards, so that's going to be a negative 0.53. Flip that one because it's, not, it's, it's backwards from what we have. So it's going to be negative 0.53, and we're going to get a positive voltage, the exact voltage, 2.7 minus 0.53 is the lowest, about 2.3. And of course, you buy a battery um, from Menards or Home Depot, and this is just a, a, a battery pack. It has little cells in it, and each little cell produces that voltage. It's exactly even how a Tesla works. Tesla batteries have um, just stacked full of little, little batteries, and they add up. Okay, gold and sodium. Okay, so metal is changed into metals. Right now, um, in this case, gold has multiple charges. Sodium does not. So sodium, metal, and gold. I'm not really sure what charge we'll choose for gold. Let's see what's on the chart. All right, let's go back and look. Find a gold on here. All right. Let's see here. Plus three. Okay, so let's use plus three at this point. It's 1.5 volts. Okay, so let's go plus three and there's a three there. Okay, AU goes to AU plus three. That's a plus three electrons is going to give me right, a negative 1.5 volts and then. Here we have sodium plus those two sodium metal, and that's plus one electron. Let's get our voltage on this guy. All right, the sodium, that's a reduction as is. It's, so there's the goal. The sodium is way down here at negative 2.71. All right, negative 2.71. Once again, this thing is not going to occur. Okay? A couple different examples there. Okay, finally, get down to the end here. Okay, it may be a little bit of a long video, my apologies, but the following reactions predict the products and calculate the voltage. Okay, I'm going to skip these for now. Okay, we did this already, so you have an opportunity to try some more on your own. 
Um, but um, well, let's pause it for a second. Just for you to try it out here. So I'll pause the video, give you a few minutes for you to try it. I'm just going to plop the angels up here. All right, so we put this together. I set it up. Hope you had a chance to try it on your own. You'll notice here we have a positive 2.87, negative 1.36 gives me a positive 1.51 volts. You notice that these products of this reaction will be NaF, that's a spectator ion, plus Cl2 will yield NaCl plus uh, F2. You'll notice that these products are actually the reactants of this thing. So if a reaction is going to go this way, there's no reason why it would turn around at this point this reaction and go the other way. Which is why this is going to give me a negative 2.87 positive 1.36, give me a negative 1.51 overall. This process will not proceed to products. This one will. That's great. Okay. This is a pretty common scenario where they want you to use these guys to produce a spontaneous process. Notice they're both reductions. Which one has to get flipped? To be positive, the bottom would have to get flipped. Because I, otherwise I'd be negative. So I'm going to flip this one around need this to be my oxidation reaction, this to be my reduction. So we'll go Al plus 3 plus 3 electrons yields Al metal. And then I have magnesium 2 plus plus 2. Flip that one. Okay. It's Al metal. And uh, in this case, negative 1.66 volts. Flip this one. Magnesium metal goes to magnesium 2 plus plus 2 electrons and a positive 2.37 volts. Overall balanced, 2 and 3. How do we balance that? We'll put this one times 2, this one times 3. It's going to give me 2, 2, 3, 3. If I count multiple, it's 6. This is given away. This is picked up. 2 aluminum plus 3 plus two, uh, plus three magnesium metals yields two aluminum metals plus three magnesium, two pluses. And I will have to add those together for my positive voltage. There we go. All right, in this case, here's a, again, possible problem for you to try. Notice I have different substances in here, and I would like you to take those things and arrange them for which is going to give you the positive voltage. I'll pause the video and I'll pop up the answer. Go ahead and give it a try. Now again, we have two metals and two helium ions. Which combinations give me a positive voltage? Try it out. Alright, so in this case, I have these four things available, and I'm going to use the zinc metal in combination with the copper ion. And that's going to give me my two half reactions, which will be positive, and give me a 1.1 voltage. I did not need the copper metal as a reactant, and I did not need the zinc ion as a reactant. So I would have a little copper beaker, and I could fill it full of copper 2 plus ions, and there would be an anion in there as well. And then I drop in a stick of zinc. And of course, the reaction would happen all by itself, 1.1 volts. On this one again, how do I know here? I'm going to take, uh, I have fluorine. There's a little notation, looks like this. Fluorine to fluoride. That's one option. And I have, then another option would be chloride going to fluorine. I'm just taking out the spectator ions and those. The other option would be going from, flipping around, fluoride going to fluorine. And then chloride going to the to any, uh, chlorine going to the chloride I just flip them around and you'll find that in this case this is the one that is going to run at a positive voltage go ahead, we've had examples in the past so again just looking for which combination gives me a positive exchange alright Last thing we're going to talk about here the last thing is, do all reaction reactions look like this? The answer is no. Combustion reactions are, in fact, 
redox reaction. So, for example, hydrogen plus oxygen yields water. This is a redox reaction. We start with no charge, and this thing ends up having little what are called oxidation states. It's hard to see. A little bit beyond what we typically do in this class, but this is a redox reaction. We're giving it oxygen. Combustion reactions were the original oxidation reduction reactions. And of course, this is the same thing. No charge, and inside here it's bonded, it has some small oxidation states, but not always going to look the same. And that's okay. So eventually we'll eventually get to a point where we might learn some of these, but at this point, we stop with our typical model of a redox reaction. Thank you.